they wanted to rebuild the Balkans, uh, do Somalia, uh, ultimately remake the Middle East as a whole. And this argument that Iraq was just about WMDs is, is, is post hoc. The people in the room knew the right decisions to ask about that intelligence, and the people outside of that used it as a crutch. This was about a bigger thing, and that project is fundamentally anti-conservative. Welcome back to The Kevin Roberts Show. Thanks so much for joining us this week and every week. You're in for a real treat. Given our guest this week, my friend of many years now, Dr. Will Ruger is currently the president of the American Institute for Economic Research. Today, we're going to cover economics, foreign policy, this little conflict in Ukraine, where the conservative movement is going. We'll probably even talk about school choice in our favorite state, Texas. <laughs> but all that to say, Will, thanks for making the effort to be here and for joining me. Thanks for having me. So how did you get into doing what you're doing? I told you off camera that we're going to get into some heady stuff, foreign mm. policy, economics, right. as I just mentioned. I definitely want our audience to know about the work that you're doing at the Institute. But I've always been intrigued about, and genuinely, just as a friend, your personal story, your commitment to this country. But what is it that has, um, you know, in your lifetime that's caused you to be so motivated to do what you do? Well, you know, I started out my career as a scholar. Uh, I was a political. And in spite of that, you're a good guy. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was tenured radical, even <laughs> right uh, down at Texas State University. But I, I, I was a scholar at the beginning of my career for most of my career. But I always had an interest in not just the study of political science, of international relations, of political theory, uh, but actually how that gets translated into the real world. And, and I've always thought that it's important to connect up and to be, and I've been always interested in social and political change. And so even when I was a professor, I, I, I wrote a book with a colleague of mine uh, called Freedom in the 50 States that looks at the various states and ranks them on different types of variables. So even though it was a scholarly approach to the subject, it was very much connected to that policy world. The other thing is that I've often, I've also been interested in the, on the practitioner side. So, uh, and I'm patriotic, uh, I'm old fashioned that way. You know, my grandfather was in the Battle of the Bulge and I have a family history of military service. So uh, when I was uh, already had my PhD, family, white picket fence, all that stuff, I, I joined the, the Navy Reserve and uh, part of that was uh, my goal was to go to Afghanistan and contribute to our effort there. Uh, and so I've had this career as an academic, as, uh, as a Navy, uh, as a sailor, and, uh, and then uh, had an opportunity to come to Washington about a decade ago, uh, which I did and got more involved in what's happening here. And now I'm at the American Institute for Economic Research heading up uh, what I think is going to be a, a great contributor, already is a great contributor to the world of ideas and to the practical realities of our country's future. Well, I will underscore that it is, and I will talk about the, that here momentarily. I just want to be really clear for our audience. You did go to Afghanistan. You achieved your goal. Yeah, and uh, look, uh, uh, for people who, who know some of my history like you do, you know that, uh, that I uh, believed in the original mission, right? I thought it was important for the United States after 9-11 to do three things, right? We needed to punish the Taliban for their state support of al-Qaeda, we needed to attrit, decimate Al-Qaeda as an effective terrorist organization with the intent and capability to harm us. And we needed to kill Osama bin Laden or capture him. And, you know, I think it worked out well. Uh, those are the three goals we needed to. But I got involved in the movement to get us out of this forever war uh, because I thought that our war aims had crept beyond what was necessary to meet our national interests. And we'll get more into this, but our foreign policy should be fundamentally rooted in what is good for the United States? What helps us stay safe, protect the conditions of our prosperity, and protect our liberal democratic system here at home, our Republican form of constitutional government? That's what we need to do. Not do social work, not do democracy promotion in places that are sketchy in terms of their commitment to the values we have, uh, and not sacrifice American blood and treasure for things that aren't connected to those vital national interests. So I believed our mission was necessary in Afghanistan to achieve those goals, but then it crept. It went well beyond that. And so I, I thought that it was important to fight back against that. And fortunately, under President Trump, 
we had the Doha agreement and then uh, President Biden dithered, but eventually I think did the right thing. Now, again, they implemented it terribly. The withdrawal. Right, the withdrawal. But the decision itself was supportive of the national interest. And that's why President Trump supported it. And so many other people in, in the city did as well. Well, we're going to talk a lot about foreign policy so we're going to, uh, I guess I'll caution the audience, you and I, because of our familiarity, are going to kind of hopscotch through some topics, which yeah. is usually how our email threads, uh, <laughs> phone calls, in-person conversations go. So for the audience, you've been warned. Yeah. We're going to come back to foreign policy, yeah, absolutely. which was uh, the, the, the real reason to have you on. But the reason that I, I, I want to just press pause on that is because I don't want to give short shrift to the American Institute for Economic Research. It's sure. really important for people to know, as you, as you mentioned, an overview of the work that you do, but also because the the institution is already a very important one on the center right in American politics under your leadership, not being patronizing, you know, mm -hmm. it's not something that I do. It's already expanding. So tell us about that work before we get back to form. Sure. And I'm very proud of what we do at, at our institution. You know, we educate people about the values of economic freedom, of individual liberty, of sound money, of limited government, of property rights, these principles that I think go to the core of what America has been all about. And, and that's why we focus on those things. And we were founded in 1933, so we're one of the oldest research institutions, independent research institutions in the country, founded by a, a military man. Uh, so it's, it's sort of interesting that I'm, I'm there now. Uh, he worked for MacArthur in uh, the Philippines in, in World War II. Uh, he was a veteran, uh, sorry, he was a, a, an army uh, officer who was fed up by what was going on in the country in terms of our economic policies, particularly when it came to monetary policy. And so we founded the Institute in Cambridge, Mass. We eventually moved out to Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Um, but we do three basic things within that broader mission, uh, which you might call a kind of right of center, classical liberal, very traditionally American conservative argument, I think, or approach. Uh, we do kind of three things. We look at monetary economics. So this has been, unfortunately, it's bad for our country, but it's been good for AIER to be able to weigh in on this. But we talk about the causes and consequences of inflation. We look at what are the ideal types of monetary policy and how can we get towards those. Uh, we look at certain financial indicators there. So that's one of our three kind of pillars. Our second is economics and economic freedom. So we use price theory, Austrian economics, public choice theory. We use economics to look at public policy issues that relate to economic freedom. Um, and that could be across the board, but a lot of emphasis on regulation and some of the problems you see from uh, you know, kind of Baptist and bootlegger coalitions that form and uh, some of the problems of regulation and stymieing the American economy, which we see all too, too much. Uh, so that's our third pillar. And our third is our newest, which we call defending freedom and combating collectivism. And what we do in this pillar, uh, and this is headed up by a mutual friend of ours, uh, Sam Gregg, uh, is we're really looking at some of the biggest threats to freedom today. And unfortunately, there are so many, uh, and we try to make sure we have a focus. Uh, but one of the big ones is ESG, right? Uh, you know, this is highly destructive of the proper role of business in society. And so we're trying to combat this and really emphasize the notion that, you know, business has a purpose, right? It's to provide customers with value. It's to, it's to provide shareholder value uh, when it comes to publicly um, you know, traded companies. Uh, it's that old fashioned Milton Friedman approach. Uh, and it's not that you know, your business needs to be involved in woke politics. It, it doesn't need to be involved in trying to save the world. Oftentimes because, uh, not to dork out a little bit, but it doesn't have the kind of, uh, we might say epistemological uh, basis to do so. In other words, uh, it doesn't have the knowledge to know how to best do that, right? It knows, you know, you know. Um, you can dork out, by the way. Sure, it's one of the reasons yeah. for the long form right. podcast. Yeah, but uh, you know, Levi's or Disney, right? They should focus on what they know best: make jeans, right? Uh, provide great entertainment for kids that's wholesome. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, Walt Disney did that. Uh, we all love those old old shows, right? Uh, don't focus on those things uh, that are that uh, you know are really outside of your purview, especially when you're doing it in a way to virtue signal, or uh, because you've been captured by a kind of your HR departments or or kind of left wing ideology. 
Uh, and again, I, I, you know, I'm a free market guy. I think businesses should be able to choose what they want to do. But as a shareholder, I think you'd want to insist that you focus on the, the reason why you probably bought that stock in the first place. So we do ESG. We also, we've ha had uh, a great scholar, Phil Magnus, who works on the 1619 project. Uh, he and the and, and that project have been at odds for a, a little while, and uh, it's kind of fun to see the back and forth. But Phil's right about this, right? The 1619 project is a travesty, and it's part of an overarching, I think, identitarianism that is destructive of the individualism of uh, you know the kind of proper individualism of the American experience, right? The the, the one that De Tocqueville talked about, not a kind of individualism of. Uh, you know, a, a, a kind of uh, that's anti-community or, or that is, uh, you know, kind of a stereotype, but uh, an embedded liberal uh, individualism of families and, and civil society, but ultimately that it's individualist in the sense that we think all individuals have moral dignity, we want to protect their rights, and they're embedded in these communities, um, and we're going to be best if we, if we trust the individual uh, within the confines of the law, and that we make sure that individuals are protected to kind of live their lives as they see fit without Washington telling them to. On the thank you for that explanation, I want to key in on the first couple of parts of, of or your first couple of pillars of monetary policy and, and mm -hmm. economics. Although you know me well enough to know I really want to go down the de Tocqueville path. Yeah. Maybe we'll hopscotch <laughs> to that before the end of the episode after we talk about foreign policy. Sure. Because I know a lot of the audience want to hear your thoughts on that. But on, on monetary policy, is it are you at all even slightly optimistic that we're going to get the political left, the center, and the political right to understand that what we're living through right now in 2023 is the direct result of really bad monetary policy, really bad actions by the government? Or sort of like me, and you know I'm an optimist, I'm fairly pessimistic that they've learned their lessons. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of decay in American society that makes me worried. Uh, I'm just old enough to have memories of the 70s and how that seemed similar to some of the things we're seeing today. And one of the things about the 70s was stagflation. It was gas lines, stagflation, garbage all over the road until people said, don't mess with Texas, right? And you felt there was a feeling of decay coming out of the, you know, the late 1960s, early 70s. Um, but I, I, I hope that we can have a revival in our country. And I'm, you know, I'm a short-term pessimist, long-term optimist, maybe. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, you, know, we had the, the, you know, the Reagan Revolution, you had Morning in America. By 1984, we win the Cold War at the end of the, uh, end of the 80s. So hopefully we can turn it around. But I am worried about the fact that we don't seem to learn a lot of these lessons. Um, and this time I'm worried because I'm not sure that our culture that undergirds our society is as strong and resilient as it was. And so, again, that's why I think we need to uh, you know, people talk about these culture wars and sometimes people make fun of it as if like this is a distraction. No, I think a lot of the cultural issues are actually the ones that are going to be necessary to reground our country so that we can take off and, and get back on the path that we were. On the particular issue of, uh, of this, the reason I bring this story up about the 70s is that we did wake up. Part of that was because we had uh, Paul Volcker, and he understood what needed to happen. And I think that was, he, he played an important individual role. And then you had a president, President Reagan, who obviously suffered because the economy was hurt by this in, in, in the short run. But we did get our act together. And I'd like to think that we can do that again. However, the political incentives are such that, you know, there's a lot of folks that don't want to maybe do what is necessary because they worry about the short term economic and political cost of maybe doing that. And so you always have to worry where, where short-run political incentives overcome what's good for our country in the long run. And that's why it's important that you know, places like AIER and Heritage and others, that we keep sounding the clarion, this is a mistake, this is bad, we need to stop. You know, we need to be making sure that there's a pressure put upon these actors. We need to have the better ideas, which is what our institutions do. But we also need to make sure that people are engaged and that every, you know, the kind of every man in America is armed and equipped to participate in our process, to put pressure on, on, on folks. Uh, and hopefully we can signal. And again, the Federal Reserve is somewhat insulated from politics intentionally. Um, 
And so there may be some limits if the bad ideas continue. And I know my team, uh, you know, is, is pretty wise about what a better a, a policy uh, kind of a, a set of institutions would be to, to manage our money policy. Uh, and I fear that these people don't believe in those, uh, you know, the folks that are engaged on this. But I guess in one sense, we could say we could be fortunate because there is a feedback mechanism. Inflation goes up if they do the wrong thing. Uh, and... And what that means is the American public is going to start screaming. I mean, they already are. The problem is that you have some people like, you know, Senator Warren talking about how inflation is because of greedy companies, right? Well, the common joke is, well, when they, when they lower prices, is that because they change? They're less greedy? I mean, it's kind of silly, right? I don't think we can expect that from Senator Warren. No, but, but again, if the American public starts to realize that, like, the problem is, is, is in our kind of monetary and, and political authorities as opposed to, you know, simply greedy companies or whatnot. I mean, again, I hope we can get back to it, but I agree with you. There are real structural reasons why you can see the incentives line up in a way that we won't handle this the way we should that we will continue to have maybe not six and a half, seven percent or eight and a half uh, percent inflation, but we'll still have inflation that's too high. And that creates problems downstream in the economy. And I do worry about that 1970s redux. No, the, the uh, similarities ha are already eerie. Right. And um, hopefully we don't go down that, that path. I, I am just old enough too to remember them. A lot of, a lot of follow-up questions I might ask, but the one that occurs to me is because you invoked this a couple of times in your response, Will, the, the wisdom of the American people, the feedback mechanism, the will of the people, the the gravest pessimists on the political right, good people, but they're just pessimistic, mm -hmm. say, Kevin, you know, what, what AIER and Heritage and other right of center groups are doing is really good, we're supportive, but ultimately we think the American people may be too far gone because of a really poor education system mm -hmm. and from being conditioned into accepting on a good day mediocrity. What's your response to that? Because it's a, it's a yeah. heartfelt pessimism. No, and, and I think some of that pessimism is, is grounded in some real realities about the problems of our country. Um, you know, I, I think there has been cultural decay. Uh, and, and we see this. I think you, know, you, you, you can't... Uh, and again, I mentioned a simple thing like, like garbage in the streets. And it's, this, it's, it's, you know, it's not the end of the world, but it's a sign of something else. Uh, you know, I was in uh, Pittsfield last year, which is a place that is in Western Mass that's kind of suffered from some of the kind of structural changes in the world economy. And 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 someone walked out of a bank and just threw uh, the slip on the ground. You know, it, it's that kind of thing where you don't kind of, you're not considerate of, of your community. You don't care. You don't have pride in your community. You don't have respect those are things that, again, this is a one-off thing, but I think we see it in a lot, a lot of places, right? And, uh, and I don't think it's the, uh, the fault of a free society because a free society doesn't have to be degenerative. If you have a kind of strong foundation, strong values in, in our communities, in our families, strong civil society that helps educate the next generation on things like propriety, uh, to, to try to live... Uh, a virtuous life and what that virtuous life means and a confidence that there's a big T truth that we could try to seek and that values are not just a, a kind of free for all. I mean, I, again, it's that kind of soft relativism that I've worried about for a long time that I think is a, a corrosive of the foundations of a free society. You know, I'm an old fashioned fusionist in that sense and think that freedom is important, but so are a strong set of values that undergird freedom. And one of the reasons why I, I believe in freedom as well is it allows people to become virtuous. Uh, you have to kind of flex those muscles. And I think that one of the problems I have with some conservative solutions to our cultural problems is a, is a kind of desire for a short-term short policy fix as opposed to that kind of long-run educational, social, truly social change we need to have staying power that could allow for true virtue. Because if something isn't freely chosen, it's not virtuous. It might, it might have good effects, but it's not necessarily virtuous. So I want, to marry, I want to have those things be married. A strong sense of freedom, a strong sense of virtue. Is it your sense that the conservative movement, as it were, is, is reckoning with that productively right now? I mean, there's a, there's, there are tensions, right? I mean, I think, I think all of the institutions on the right of center uh, appreciate the, the collectivist dangers that are coming from the left. 
and you know we need to do more together to to combat that i think um yeah a lot of opportunity there a lot of need and opportunity right uh but i also think that you know there's a there's some tensions that are probably healthy now again i would love if everybody in the conservative movement would adopt you know the aier program right uh Maybe not because I, I'm enough, I have enough humility to know that we could be wrong. You're also right? enough of a contrarian that I think you like the <laughs> disagreement, right? Yeah. Well, I think there's a healthy tension. You're very friendly contrarian. Yeah. Yeah. But I think there's some probably some healthy yeah. tension, right? We need to wrestle with things. Um, I think for too long, for example, we didn't think about public administration, right? There's nothing that violates the libertarian canon, even, that says that when government does something like running public schools, that we should just hand it off to the experts and that it would be improper, you know, for government to manage government, right? So the idea, for example, that, um, you know, whether it's uh, at the local level, school board level, even in some cases where it might be appropriate at the state level, that that there should be input from the public and and how we go about providing public services should be a, a discussion of, of publics and governments. I think that we need to to remember that and focus on it. And and, that, and I think that we want to be careful, I think, about constraining uh, areas that are outside of the proper role of government. But, you know, I loved it when I saw what happened out in Loudoun last year when parents got involved and said, wait a second, like, if we're going to have, we have these public schools, we ought to have some say in this. And how we deal with children isn't a matter of kind of the same type of philosophical discussion that you have among what adults should be able to do, right? I mean, what what adults should be able to purchase at Barnes and Nobles or less reputable businesses is a different story than what the public libraries should have or what should be in the in, in the schools. And I think that those are where I think some of these kind of like struggles have been probably good on the right to kind of remind us that we still have to pay attention to public administration. Uh, on the other hand, there are some areas where I do worry. Um, I do worry about um, uh, the trade issue, for example. Now, I think it's perfectly reasonable given the rise in power of China uh, and some of the issues there where you have uh, tech theft, IP protection issues, uh, you know, dual use technology issues. You know, those are real concerns. And even Adam Smith understood that. Yeah. So it's not a violation of free market economics to be worried about those security concerns. But we do have to be careful that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I do think that the United States, again, uh, you know, should be, you know, benefits from a robust uh, trade system uh, because we win a lot of those. And I know I mean, economics isn't a zero sum game, but in the sense that you know th these are mutually beneficial. So for example, I would love to see a free trade agreement between the United States and the, and the UK, because I think that would be mutually beneficial for both of us. It doesn't touch on some of the kind of tougher challenges of like a trade agreement with Vietnam where you know, there, there are different types of political economy challenges. It's a wonderful idea, by the way, which everyone here at Heritage would support. Yeah. So, so again, I, I mean, why, cool, let's try to find some of that low-hanging fruit where we can agree. Um, but, I, but again, there are, there are some people that maybe want to use government a little bit more than I would. But I think it's good for us to have these arguments right now. Uh, let's do that so that the next time uh, there are people in office that would be more friendly to the types of ideas. I mean, we're a C3 organization. We don't, you know, we're not, uh, you know, we're not doing advocacy, but we certainly want these ideas to be taken off the shelf the next time there's a chance. So one of the tensions in the conservative movement, one that, that you and I are, are part of, and I think in a, in a productive way, is foreign policy. Right. And I would say that you were among the first people on the political right whom I respected, who in, in your very good way uh, as a professor, teacher, suggested to me that there needed to be an updated updating of thinking mm -hmm. as conservatives because of, uh, as you mentioned earlier, your experience in Afghanistan, supporting the original mission, I often refer to myself as a recovering neocon. Mm -hmm. And I think some people take that to be pejoratively. I don't mean it that way. I right. actually mean it to be descriptively, mm -hmm. to be descriptive. But the point is, uh, in addition to all of the, the work that you've done over many years on that point, in the last month or so, you wrote a, a wonderful piece in Responsible Statecraft, I believe, where you laid this out. And, and you, you sort of presented the landscape of foreign policy thinking on the political right. And I, in, in a way that I think is fair and thoughtful, 
uh, constructively critical of, of, of the limitations of each of those positions for the purposes of our audience, many of whom I'm sure are keying in on this conversation with you for this reason. Give us a, a quick summary of, of that landscape. Sure. You know, 20 years ago, you know, in the 90s, even in the early aughts, right, until everybody started to see what was happening in Iraq, you know, there was a, a foreign policy consensus that wasn't just a foreign policy consensus on the right. It was actually a foreign policy consensus across the aisle, uh, which should give you some pause, I think. Uh, it just did. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, whether it was uh, Bill Crystal or Samantha Power, More right, pause. you know, th these are folks who, who are activists when it comes to foreign policy. They want the United States not just to be strong, right, but to be actively, you know, trying to... Uh, uh, you know, be the world's policeman, make the world a better place using the American, uh, you know, soldiers. Um, it was a primacist vision for the United States. And look, I want the United States to be number one, right? I'm a patriot. I think also it's valuable for us to be, you know, the most powerful nation on the planet. A lot of that is if we have a strong economy and a strong society. Uh, and, we, you know, we, we need to have a strong society to ultimately have a strong economy. Uh, that's where our power comes from. Um, you know, this is when Admiral um, Mike Mullen, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, said, what's our biggest national security threat? And I thought he might say China or Iran or terrorism. Those would be reasonable arguments. Um, we could debate how strong a threat those are. But and he said our national debt and deficits. And the reason he said that is because, look, it's our economy that is the foundation of having a strong military. We could spend a small percentage of GDP to have a pretty damn good military because our economy is so strong. So we need to keep that and that technological edge. So it's, it's not that these people, we disagree that we wanted to have strength. It's that that amount of activism the primacists wanted, right? They wanted to rebuild the Balkans, uh, do Somalia, uh, ultimately remake the Middle East as a whole. And this argument that Iraq was just about WMDs is, is, is post hoc. The people in the room knew the right decisions to ask about that intelligence, and the people outside of that used it as a crutch. This was about a bigger thing. And, and, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, Bob Kagan recently admitted this you know, saying that it was, you know, a, a much bigger project. Um, and that project is fundamentally anti-conservative. And I saw this earlier. I mean, uh, I, I, I've been someone who has believed in realism and restraint for a long time. Uh, I'm happy to have people come to it whenever they come to it. Thank you. Uh, you don't have to be an OG like Ted Carpenter or, uh, you know, uh, Eugene Goltz at Notre Dame. Um, you know, these, uh, I think it's important to come to it. And one part of it is the lamp of experience, right? Uh, Patrick Henry talked about the lamp of experience. And the lamp of experience is that the last 20 to 30 years of our foreign policy has been an ma absolute mess, guided by people in Washington that we would not want them to run the American healthcare system. But yet we want to turn over remaking the world. And I think that's a fundamentally anti conservative view. We don't know all the things we would need to do to turn Helmand province of Afghanistan into a thriving liberal democracy where, you know, women are empowered to live the way they do in our country uh, and where, you know, they can thrive the same way people in Des Moines do. We just don't know how to do that. I mean, I don't want nation building in Detroit when it comes to nation building directed by Washington or hell, even the governor of Michigan, right? Especially the governor of Michigan. Yeah, right, exactly. So, why do we why do we think we can do this? And again, part of it is that we have a, we're patriotic. We have a can do spirit. People talk about that, right? Like part of the challenge for Americans is that we, you know, we're we're optimistic in many ways. Uh, we have a can do spirit. We are great at a lot of things, uh, but not every problem in the world is something we can actually handle. Because look, we are a small percentage of the world's population, and even though we have a huge economy. You know, it, it, it's not as if we have infinite resources. And so it's looking at that last 30 years, whether it's all the way back to the 90s or it's Iraq, the Afghan nation building project, Libya, which is an underrated disaster, uh, and the, uh, Syria, which we tried to stay out of or sort of tried to stay out of, but got back into. And we're seeing there's some of the results this week of that, unfortunately. 
and uh, and part of it is it's built on so many flawed ideas that are fundamentally anti-conservative. Restraint is a conservative position. It's based on realism. So Mike Desch and I wrote a piece for the national interest called uh, uh, Realism and Conservatism, uh, Kissing Cousins. Because I think the fundamental premises of realism and of conservatism go hand in hand, right? A kind of humility about your ability to make the world as you see fit an understanding of the knowledge problem that you have, the understanding of trade-offs, of opportunity costs, uh, an understanding of the fact that military power is well-suited for some things and not for other things, an understanding of realities, right? One of the great things about, about I think, conservative economic thinking for the last, you know, uh, you know, 70 years, 80 years, is a kind of realism about it. We looked, you know, we looked at, the great society and said, you can't remake our country this way. We looked at bad economic policies of even the New Deal, the NRA, for example, that the Supreme Court ultimately struck down or the AAA or these things and said, this is, this is not based on good economics because it doesn't appreciate human nature. It doesn't appreciate constraints. It doesn't appreciate unintended consequences. All those things came into even the neoconservative critique of great society, right? And yet you have these uh, neoconservatives and other conservatives promoting this, and it, it culminates really with Iraq and with George W. Bush's inaugural address. You read George Bub W. Bush's inaugural address today, you're like, wow, this is nuts. It is. I, I just did that over the weekend. Yeah. And, and, and at the time, I was applauding it. Right. You know, just so people know, I'm not throwing stones. Yeah. If someone's listening saying, man, I'm not really with Will and Kevin on this, <laughs> it, it, there's time. I just, yeah. just go back and read that in particular. Well, and and... I, I just got back from Athens uh, uh, and we were, I was at a conference and we were talking about this famous thing called the Sicilian expedition that the Athenians did. It was like their Iraq or their Vietnam, uh, their Waterloo in many ways, right? Uh, and uh, we read at the end of that uh, conference, we read uh, JFK's in, uh, uh, pay any price speech. And you read the pay any price speech and you read George W. Bush's inaugural, second inaugural, and you're like, whoa. This is crazy. And you could see how it got us into Vietnam and it got us into, into Iraq. And these were mistakes. Again, we need to have a strong national defense. Realism understands that the world can be a dangerous place. It's an anarchic in, you know, universe, right? Meaning that there's no higher power that can uh, secure you in that world. You, so you have it's a self-help system. You have to protect yourself in it, and that means you have to pay attention to uh, the balance of power. You have to pay attention to to uh, changes in the balance of power about threats. What's the threat environment? And so uh, you know, restraint isn't always the right foreign policy for your country. I mean, prudence is, but the notion of of uh, the kind of more formal understanding of restraint as being very uh, uh, hostile to foreign interventionism, right? The notion of not going abroad in search of monsters to destroy is one key pillar of restraint. And then also is being careful about making commitments to other countries when it doesn't tear up to your national interests. Those are the kind of Washingtonian kind of pillars. And I think that restraint counsels that because it's realistic about looking at the world as it is. That's, I mean, that's why I always talk about realism and restraint. It's realism is the foundation of how we should think about international politics and restraint is the grand strategy we should pursue because of the reality of the world today. So I would have had a very different foreign policy view if it was 1948 than I would today. We needed to build NATO. We needed to confront the threat of Soviet communism. Uh, we needed to, the balance of power was very different than it is now. That requires a different, and, and, and what we needed in, the 1790s was different than what we needed in 1948, right? You know, and so I think we have to be careful about being ideological about foreign policy thinking. I mean, again, we have our national interests, our North Star, and part of that is protecting our, our democratic way of life here at home. Um, but I do believe you have to tune to the times. And, and again, I, I'm going on, uh, but what are those things about the world today that sh should help us think about how a realist, how a conservative should, should think about what we should do in the world. And some of those key things are constraints. So just like supply and demand curves are constraints in, in, in domestic politics, in the, in the domestic economy, the balance of power is a constraint in the international system. So what does the balance of power look like? Well, the United States is the most powerful country in the world, uh, but there are other states that are powerful too. 
Um, but geography we, we, is, is part of, of those set of constraints, right? So one thing about the world is that we live far away from the rest of the world. There are no other great powers near us. And people say, well, but the world is so much smaller today. You can travel. I mean, look, get on a ship, let, let alone a plane, and go to Hong Kong, right? I mean, it takes forever to get to China from or Europe on a plane. Imagine on ships. It's hard to project power across large bodies of water. And so while the world is smaller in some ways, it still means that how are, are how is another country like Russia, even assuming that they could get through Ukraine and then assuming they could get through Poland and Germany and assuming that the French don't nuke them because the French have a nuclear capability, how are they going to impinge on the United States in the way that, that we worried about in 1812 or that we worried about even in 1941, right? So those constraints matter, especially because we have the world's strongest military, world's strongest Navy, world's strongest Air Force. So we can keep a lot of those threats far away from us. Um, and then when it comes to um, things like uh, the balance of power, we have to think about the nature of technology, right? That matters. Anti-access area denial capabilities are really important now, right? We can use sensors, um, torpedoes, missiles to keep people away from things. And that's an important part of the balance. Defense is easier. We're seeing that, right? Uh, when defense is easier, like it was in, in 1914, it makes it hard to conquer. When offense is easier, like it was in 1939, it makes it easier. And we should understand what that offense-defense balance is because it affects how we ought to look at the world. And then, then the big game changer, again, is nuclear weapons. And people seem to forget this. Like, we have this discussion about Ukraine as, as if, like, oh, why worry about the risk of nuclear escalation? That'll never happen. Uh, I do not want to take that risk. And unfortunately, I think a lot of the people who, who I think rightfully look at the bravery of Ukrainians and say like, hey, you know, we need to support them. They're not looking at the escalatory risk to our fundamental national interest, which is our safety here at home. So again, you have to look at all those constraints. And one, in, you know, in terms of that balance of power, like it's hard to imagine Russia or China uh, over, overcoming uh, the international system in the way that we worried about with Nazi Germany, um, and even the, even the you know Germany in 1914 wasn't the kind of systemic threat that that people thought. But again, if Eurasia could be dominated by one single country from the UK all the way to Japan, that would be a worry for the United States. But the balance of power is pretty robust. I mean, it's hard to imagine Russia dominating the Eurasian balance of yeah, power. Yeah, it's it's impossible for me to. I I would probably. Well, I wouldn't probably. I it definitely would say China's in a much better position to do that. But I, I want to ask you. As a, China is the most important strategic threat we face, yeah, which we is why we have to get our European strategy right. Exactly. And that's, that's where I wanted to go is if, if you found yourself tomorrow in charge of, of American policy toward Ukraine, what would you do? Um, the, one of the most important things we can do right now is to make sure that we're keeping an eye on the danger of an escalatory spiral with Russia. Because like I said, if our three national interests are our territorial integrity, right, our safety here at home, the conditions of our economic prosperity and our democratic system here at home, not abroad, then uh, the biggest worry is that we would get into a nuclear exchange. Um, and again, I, I feel bad for the people of Ukraine. They're in a bad neighborhood. Oof. But whether Ukraine is fully independent and and owns Crimea or whether Ukraine essentially disappeared into the near abroad of Russia, that's not going to affect any of those th three things I just talked about. Now, does that mean that I want Russia to roll all the way to Lviv? Of course not. No, right? Um, but we have to be clear eyed when we make foreign policy and we have to recognize that if we're talking about how we have to let Ukraine do anything it takes is the word we hear and we're going to provide that blank check. What happens when, if, and when, or when and if, um, Ukraine pressures fundamental Russian security interests and we get into an escalation? What does that mean for us? Does that mean that you could see a, a use of tactical nuclear weapons by Russia? What response would that bring from the United States? H um, if, you know, people talk about how 
regime change in Russia is what has to be the result of all this. Well, what does that mean for what the United States does? And what does that mean for how the other side reacts? Because part of being a realist is to understand that international politics isn't a one-sided game. Yeah, and the uncertainties of, of a regime change in Russia are are pretty pretty scary. Yeah, I mean, maybe you get something even further to the, to the to the nutty side, right? Uh, and the other thing about back to the balance of power and unintended consequences is that our activities trying to counter a relatively weak Russia has actually brought China and Russia together again. That's not good. I mean, we should be doing something more like a reverse Kissinger, right? Now, I'm not saying we do that right now with Putin, but if we had been much more thoughtful about this in years past, rather than poking Russia in the eye, we had figured out a better modus vivendi that kept Russia and China apart, that would be much better for American interests. I mean, I still believe, and, and I'm, I'm more than willing to take the heat on this, the United States' policy towards NATO um, has been a major screw-up. Okay? Explain that. United States security doesn't require Ukraine or Georgia to be inside NATO. They don't add to our security. They actually undermine our security. That's correct. Okay. So why keep the open door principle if it's not necessary for us? And it actually can have some unintended effects of stimulating the security dilemma. Now, again, this is not a justification for what Putin did. Okay. I don't like to see what happened. But I think we have to understand causally that th there is an action-reaction cycle that happens in foreign policy. And, and when we in 2008 talked about Ukraine and Georgia becoming part of NATO, now people who are U part of the Ukraine lobby would say, well, you know, that's not happening anytime soon, or this is a, you know, this is a, this was a, a you know, kind of a, a hope as opposed to a promise and things like that. But look, if you're in Russia, you're worried about this. You know, if, you know, Tucker Carlson said it, but others have said it before that, if, if the Chinese wanted to have a military alliance with Mexico and Mexico is foolish enough to want it, you're damn sure that we would be rolling the troops south. And rightfully so. Again, it, it, that would be a violation of Mexico's sovereignty. It wouldn't stand up for the rules-based international order. But we would do it because it's in our national interest. Now, again, I don't like what Russia did. I think Russia exaggerates the threat that we have to Russia. But, but understanding how you could get unintended consequences from your behavior is something we need to appreciate. And so I favored all the way back uh, years ago to something like a, a kind of non-NATO security architecture for Central Europe. Uh, when I was at, at uh, Koch, uh, we supported a study by uh, Mike O'Hanlon on an alternative security uh, architecture for Eastern Europe that was not NATO. I, I don't agree with everything Mike said, but I like the idea of thinking about what that might look like. And those are, those are the conversations we need to be having. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. But this notion that like we have an ideological fixation that NATO has to expand. Why? People talk about, well, people should be able to join. They should be able to decide their own security uh, agreements. And I'm like, yeah. We, we should too. Yeah, exactly. Right? Because people forget what, what it obligates the United States to do by well, virtue of the NATO charter. Especially because let's not fool ourselves. NATO is an American condominium, right? Without the United States, NATO is, a, is an entirely different creature. Look at the war in Libya where the United States had to pick up a lot of the baggage. Um, you know, the United States is the most important power in this. I would like to see greater s European uh, autonomy, Right. Uh, I don't know if it's a common security in foreign policy or if it's that you simply have more uh, burden sharing and burden shifting. But I do think that the Europeans, we, we have a lot of similarities with Europe. We have a lot of the same interests, but it's not exact. And look, the Germans have been playing us like a fiddle, right? You know, on the one hand, yeah, there's some of this kind of like post-World War II pacifism as part of their culture, but it's also that they are able to kind of push and buck past the cost of their defense onto the United States while they are an economic competitor and while they've built a big welfare state and they have wonderful in infrastructure. And meanwhile, you know, we have Flint, Michigan. Yeah, exactly. Right. And while they cozy up to the CCP closer than almost any nation on earth. Well, and you can understand because they, I mean, again, I, I think it's a bad idea that they do this, um, but the geostrategic threat that China poses to them is different than to us. And so naturally they will have a, a different set of policies and they're going to, uh, again, as long as we're providing the umbrella, 
they're going to focus on economics. And then, then, then you well, don't be surprised when some of their companies eat the lunch of our companies. It's a, mis- it's a, it's a terrible mistake, right? Europe needs to be an adult and Washington needs to accept that adulthood because this, the Europeans will tell you rightfully so that when people have wanted to move out of adolescence in Europe, that the United States, some people in the members of our elite have said, well, wait a second, we still want you to live in the basement. Don't grow up too fast. Why? Because they have this primacist notion. And I, I, I think that we need to think more like 19th century power political terms, right? Be realistic. We have lots of things in common. We should cooperate. Where we have differences, compete. Where we have differences, try to use diplomacy to resolve those. But sometimes you just have to say no. And, and I think that when it comes to Ukraine right now, we need to start saying no partly to get back to your question uh, more directly is one thing we could do is, is, is not only worry about the issue of escalation, but two is to uh, think about the problem of moral hazard, right? If we're saying that you get a blank check, don't be surprised when they do things that might actually be dangerous for us. I mean, I worry about a lot of American ideological people wanting to fight to the very last Ukrainian. Right. And I think that one of the unintended consequences of what the Ukraine lobby has done is, is it, the, ba- the, the burden has been faced by these brave Ukrainians. But I also worry that a lot of people are more than willing to say, like, but if we can get the United States more involved, then we could spread the costs. So if, if Ukraine wants Crimea, well, the best way to do that is to make sure that the United States is part of that effort one way or another. It's, it's, it's I mean... It, you want to send your kids to go die for uh, Crimea? Uh, of course not. A place that it's not even clear they want to be part of I Ukraine? I don't want to send any American person there. Right. And, and, that, and the interesting thing is, it's really tragic, as, as I've become enamored with saying, D.C. is the city of false dichotomies. To say that means, therefore, that you want Putin to win. Well, of course not. I mean, no. you, you've, you've made a real articulate case there, which you shouldn't even have to make. Right. But you and I both know why you do. And it's because the same people, the group of same people who brought us Iraq in particular, are fanning the flames of what has been a tragic strategic error by the United States in being as involved as it already is in Ukraine. And so we really have to peel back. Yeah. And, and on the Russia thing, I mean, when people talk about, you know, bleeding the Russians on the cheap, well, it's not cheap. It's, right. it's expensive I yeah. mean, to the tune of being larger than their entire military. Budget. Right. I mean, the Russia uh, before the war was spending, I think, about sixty five billion a year on its military. That's less than 10 percent of what the United States spend, a lot less than 10 percent, actually. Uh, and I think we it was at one hundred and thirteen mil- billion correct. that the United States has, has uh, at least authorized for this. Um, and the Russian performance has been pitiful. Right. I mean, they have gained territory. We shouldn't uh, right. ignore that. Um, but the idea, for example, that it's cheap to bleed them, A, it's not cheap. Two, it's very cynical, right? For people who talk a lot about the idealism and, and the brave Ukrainians, that notion that we should just bleed them, who's going to be bled doing that? Now, and again, if you want to be a completely cynical, amoral, hyper-realist and say, let's, let's bleed the Russians as dry as we can, even if it ki- kills every Ukrainian, but that's not the message we're hearing from those folks, right? And then, too, the issue of sovereignty. I mean, come on. Like, our, you know, it's a little bit rich when we tell the world about the importance of, of, of sovereignty. Again, I think sovereignty can be a useful thing to keep international politics from being as crazy as it could be in an anarchical world. That's why the Treaty of Westphalia that builds the nation state system and promotes sovereignty is a part of that. But again, you know, like it's, it, we should not be surprised when say the so-called global South says, you want us to support this because of sovereignty? Like, have you looked at what it's been happening over the last 30 and, years. And, and not surprisingly, the global south has said this this is your deal, not yeah. ours. Yeah. And then and then when it comes to uh you know the issue of uh of democracy promotion, um look, that's we you don't risk nuclear war for promoting things that yes, I would love if everyone wanted to again, not just in the United States, but abroad, wanted to uh have a system of government that resembles ours at least you know again every country should probably have its differences there because cultural differences but uh yeah that that upholds liberty justice uh the dignity of all individuals right we want that but is that the job of the american military is that the job i mean 
I look at this as a, in a philosophical way, given my academic background, is what is the purpose of the American government? To me, the purpose of the American government is to protect the national interest, but also the things that we came together to do and sanctified in our Constitution. And I don't know about you, but I can't find the part of the Constitution that says that we need to fight for Crimea or we need to fight for, you know, so the girls can go to school in Helmand, even though I wish they could. Or that, you know, that, that frankly, we need to underwrite the security of, you know, Australia. You know, again, if we get into bed, I mean, we already are, but, but when we get in bed with other countries, it should be because you could make a direct tie for why this supports and upholds our national interests at a reasonable cost. Yeah, that's... And you can make that case for Australia because of the threat of, of, of China. That's right. But I, you, I, I, I'm, I'm baffled at the case for, say, Georgia. I got nothing against Georgians, but it's a tiny country. People don't even, some people don't even know it is a country. They think it's a state. It is, right? But, they, but Georgia's military is tiny. The risk of a war with Russia is dangerous. Like, you know, tell me how that helps us. But again, it's part of this kind of grand ideological project that these primus have had. Right primacists, the neoconservatives, left primacists, the liberal interventionists. This project is idealistic. If you're a conservative, you should oppose it because it is not based in reality and it will get your kids fighting overseas. And then you add on top of that the culture war thing where the culture war has been internationalized. And now it's almost as if it's like, hey, we're going to send your boys and girls overseas to make sure that some of the things that we here at home oppose are part of that system abroad. I mean, it reminds me of Andy Basevich had this, uh, I think he had this, I'll paraphrase, but he had this line about uh, Crystal and Kagan, something like, these are people who don't like American society and want to export it everywhere. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it seems that way. Well, as I said, when we were getting started in this conversation, Will, we would hopscotch through some topics. And what I didn't say to you or to the audience was, I knew that if I, if I do my job right, I would get at the end of the episode several exclamation points <laughs> you succeeded <laughs> thank yeah. you i mean very very much i'm gonna give you an opportunity for a quick closing comment but I, i'm really grateful for the depth for the thoroughness of your analysis and has has always been the case since i met you several years ago your intellectual honesty you've given us a lot to talk about i agree with almost everything that you said you know that i would never being a little bit of a contrarian myself say i agree with everything absolutely probably some differences of opinion on china slight difference on on nato but you know 90, 95% agreement i'm really grateful for what you're doing the purpose of this show the purpose of heritage for that matter is is not to find unanimity of opinion but to create to facilitate the opportunity for thoughtful conversations and you've been one of the leaders in that for a long time yeah thank you and i guess in terms of my closing what i would say is that regardless of where you 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 stand uh uh, in terms of having a kind of conservative understanding of foreign policy, I think the key is that we need to be moving towards greater restraint, right? That's right. More prudentialism in our foreign policy so that we don't repeat the errors of the last 30 years and that we don't create even more dangerous ones. And I think that, that you know, what types of alliances we have, that's something we can debate. Um, and we need to debate. That's the yeah. point. I mean, and, and, and the big issue for me when it comes to alliances is actually just stopping expanding our commitments. That's the most important thing. We can't afford them right. any, by any measure. Right. So I'm not here to come and say like, yeah, let's get rid of NATO tomorrow. Right. I, I just think we need to push burden sharing and burden shifting. We need to promote you know, Europe getting its act together. But I do think we need to be cautious about expanding our security commitments. We have to be cautious about uh, us essentially allowing others to buck past their cost to the American taxpayers. But we especially need to stop fighting foolish wars and get out of the ones where, you know, there's, they're kind of almost like on autopilot and there are entrenched interests that like them. There are ideological reasons why others like them. Like what, what are we doing in Syria? I mean, just start, audience members look up some of the aspects of the, of the Kurds. It's not exactly a bunch of George Washington's. Right. It's very complicated. There are some groups that are better or worse. There are issues with Turkey. Uh, you know, w w what does the nature of the Syrian presence mean for our safety? Right. These are things we ought to be thinking a lot about. So I think that when it comes to Europe, I, we talked about that at, at length, the Middle East, we need to go offshore. Right. Uh, does it mean we shouldn't pay attention to what happens in the Persian Gulf? No. 
Uh, does it mean we should be really, really skeptical that we need to be boots on the ground and sorting out the very complicated politics of the Middle East, not just the Middle East, but the po kind of political religious struggles between Sunnism and Shiism? No, it's it's just, especially with the fracking revolution and, and other things, it, it's just not as important a, set, a part of the world as possible. Then when it comes to Asia, I think this is where we need to have humility about what is the right direction? And that's where I think there's a great conversation happening. You and Bridge Colby, for example, have, have been, I think, important voices in that conversation. I think that there are others, particularly those who, who think about a lot about anti-access area denial technologies may have different ways of thinking about how to wrestle with that. I think there's a really set of, I think, there's a really great empirical question, which I think we all wanna know with some confidence is what is the tra trajectory of China? Because if, if China is, you know, if we're thinking about like uh, the old fashioned, uh, you know, Thucydides, right? The war, the truest cause of the war was the rise of power of Athens and the fear that this provoked among the Lacedaemonians, right? The Spartans. That's essentially doing this, right? It's a, it's a uh, change in the balance of power over time. If China is on an tra upward trajectory like this, especially with 1.2 billion people, and, I, and, you know, then we got a lot of things to worry about. Even with, you know, the nuclear revolution means that maybe it's not as sharp as it was in 1941 or 1914, but it's still a big challenge, right? It's going to be a challenge in a lot of areas. But if the trajectory is, is less steep or even negative because of their dem demographic problems, their corruption, the fact that we should have faith in, in our country, in our system, right? Like communism or the kind of crony, whatever it is, crony capitalism slash planned economy is not going to work as well. Well, that's going to make it different. And, 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 I don't, and I'm not sure that that story is fully written. No, it isn't. And I would say, we'll, we'll close with this, and because we'll have you back many times over the years, is that I understand the need for understanding where China's trajectory is actually going. And often, people who are constructive critics of the, the hawkishness right. of, of me and of heritage on China, and, and you know, I'm unabashed about that, uh, you would probably put us in the prioritizers camp you know, in, in your mm -hmm. article, they would say, but to, to be fair to their, their point, they would say, well, China's just going to sort of implode because of their demographic problem. Well, the historian in me says I can point to many examples in history of those becoming very dangerous societies for order. And I, I want America to be prepared. Yeah. And I, and I think that that's an important perspective. And we, we and again, I, I'm not sure where I stand fully on some of these issues because, yeah. um, you know, I, I think that China does represent the most important strategic challenge, other than the, the one that Matt, Admiral Mullen talked yeah, about, because I do think really, our domestic front right, is, import, hand hand, is important. But again, I, I think that there's a constructive debate that needs to happen, but I think it should be a debate within realism, yes, not a debate with some of the kind of, I think, just incredible ideological thinking that's driven this town and still does, right? And that's why this frame of autocracy versus democracy is just not a good frame. I mean, we should be thinking about kind of hardcore national interests and strategy and be clear-eyed about power politics uh, because that's going to be the strongest basis, I think, going forward. An excellent statement to close the episode with. Will Ruby, right. my friend, thanks for being here. Thank you. I hope you enjoy that conversation as much as I did. I promised you a riveting one, and we did. Thank you for tuning in, and tune in next time for an equally good conversation. Take care.